see you tonight? Gee, I feel awful about not going upstairs with you. Oh, honey, will you stop it? Well, I'm sorry. I can't take it as lightly as you do. The operation doesn't take place until 4 o'clock this afternoon. Now, do you want to stay around here for seven hours holding my hand? Why not? Because. Firstly, you won't find a place to park around here. Secondly, you've got Susan to pick up at school, right? Noon. Thirdly, it's a minor operation. A hernia. It's almost a joke. Now, will you quit worrying? No. Will you try? All right. Well, that's better. Now, why don't you go home and bake some brownies? Maybe you can smuggle them in here tonight <laughs> when you visit. I hear the food in this place is brutal. <laughs> Do you mind if I call you sometime during the day? Oh, no, by all means. But if I don't ask you, you'll know I've gotten involved with that. Pretty nervous. Ah. That'd be awful pretty. Good luck, darling. See you tonight. tonight, and that's the last time I ever saw him alive. I uh, drove home. I put some brownies in the oven. It was a, a little joke. He said he wanted me to bake some brownies. Who phoned you? Uh, Dr. Spencer. He assisted Dr. Morgan in the operation. He said to hurry right over. Well, I asked him why. He said he couldn't tell me on the phone. I couldn't let it go with that. I just couldn't, so he finally told me the patient had died. I understand, Mrs. Dawson, but uh, so far I don't see anything to base a medical malpractice suit on. My husband is dead. That doesn't necessarily mean it was the surgeon's fault, you see. I'm not saying it is. I just want to find out. It's very difficult to prove medical malpractice. Well, I suspect that once you have the facts... Getting the facts is not the whole answer. Even if we ascertain the facts, the law requires that those facts be characterized by an expert, a medical man. Now, there are many doctors who in the privacy of their offices will state that another doctor made a mistake. But it's very hard to find one doctor who will state on the witness stand that another doctor's actions fail to conform with accepted medical practice. Well, Mr. Preston, I know it's... It's very difficult, but it's very difficult to be a widow. I'll have to get an authorization from you to get the records at the hospital. No, 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 Mr. Preston. There's no point in arguing. It's a matter of policy established by the Board of Trustees. 
And entirely beyond my control. But it, it couldn't be meant to apply to an instance like this, uh, could it, Mr. Eastlake? No, this is not discriminatory. It applies in all instances. This hospital and many others take the position that the patient's records are confidential and not in any event the patient's property. Well, I understand the policy and I understand the reasons for it, but uh, Arthur Dowson died in this hospital on the operating table under unusual circumstances. His case wasn't like most of the others. In fact, his wife doesn't even know about it. She's free to talk to Dr. Morgan. Well, she already has. I'd like to speak with him. And the thing is, I'd like to have something to go on, you see. I could arrange for you to get a abstract of the record, if that'll be any help. Not the record? No. I'm sorry. Not the record. Well, I'll take the abstract. I guess it's better than nothing at all. For the time being. Mr. Preston, we may as well stop fencing. You want me to speculate about the circumstances surrounding Arthur Dowson's death. Perhaps give you a critical opinion of Dr. Morgan. I'm afraid I can't help you. There's one thing you can't avoid, Doctor. Arthur Dawson was your patient. He put himself in your hands. You suggested the operation. You recommended Dr. Morgan. He took your advice and now he's dead. So don't say you can't help him. What you really mean is you won't. I haven't the faintest idea what happened in that operating room. How can I possibly tell you anything more? Didn't you ever discuss the case with Dr. Morgan? No. I found that Dawson had a simple inguinal hernia. I sent Dr. Morgan a note giving my findings and diagnosis. If he had felt any need for more, he would have called. That was up to him. It's a nice, safe position, isn't it? You didn't have any information, and you'd just as soon not have had any. Isn't that it? If it's any help, I will give you a statement concerning Dowson's condition when I saw him here, within the limits covered by my examination. That's all. Don't ask me to speculate about anything else. And try to understand my position. Try to understand Mrs. Dowson's. Yes, come in. Dr. Morgan? I'm Lawrence Preston. How do you do? There's some questions I'd like to ask concerning a former patient of yours, Arthur Dowson. Dowson? Oh, yes. I represent his widow. Oh, I see. You're an attorney, are you? Yes, I think I mentioned that to your nurse when I called about this appointment. Well, she probably told me about it. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Preston. Mr. Preston. But uh, I want you to sit down. Thank you. You see, I have uh, so many appointments and there are so many names, you understand? Yes, of course, I understand. Uh, I'll be as brief as possible. Thank you. Do you have some questions? Mrs. Dowson has. She's quite bewildered. She'd like to know exactly what happened. See? That's only natural, isn't it? Well, I suppose it's the most natural thing in the world. Or I should say, almost. What would be more natural? Dying. But very few people accept that. We all know intellectually, rationally, that death is inevitable, but uh, when someone we love dies, well, it comes as a shock. We think it must have been a mistake. We ask questions, we demand answers, but everybody dies, Mr. Preston. Doctor, I respectfully submit, not on operating tables, during the performance of rather routine surgery. Routine surgery is a layman's term, not a doctor's. There's nothing routine where a life is at stake, and that's what's at stake in every operation, no matter how minor. Life and death are always in the balance. Medicine's come a long way, but saving a life on an operating table is still a miracle. People forget that nowadays. People take the miracles for granted. They're amazed by the commonplace, like death. Of course, when the operation's successful, well, they figure that the surgeon just did his job. They pay him his fee, and they go home, as a man goes home after buying a pair of shoes. But let the patient die. Let the miracle worker fail, as he does from time to time, and then the attack is on. Relatives and friends of the deceased, accusers, lawyers. How dare you fail to perform the miracle, they ask. Nobody asks that even of God. Does that answer your question, Mr. Preston? I'm afraid that's not a good enough answer for Mrs. Dowson to live with the rest of her life. Well, would the details of her husband's death make her life any easier, do you think? At least she'll know the truth. That's better, yes. It's a little less tragic if we know someone we loved died unavoidably. 
It was God's will and not a human error. And you think I made that error? I'm trying to ascertain whether... That I made that error? I'm trying to find out if Arthur Dowson should still be alive. Mr. Preston, I told Mrs. Dowson everything I thought she ought to know. I'm sorry if she felt the need to resort to legal advice. Of course, that's her privilege. But I'm under no obligation to discuss the medical details with you, and I feel it best that I don't. Because I'm an attorney. Now, Mr. Preston, I have ten patients out here, and I've got three more at the hospital, and some of them are in serious condition. And if I had the inclination, I haven't got the time to review Arthur Dawson's case history with you. You're the only one who can, Doctor. Well, I'm afraid I've said all I'm going to. Doctor, don't you realize that by refusing to discuss this fully, you're creating doubts where there may be no basis for them? I can't help that. Wait a minute! You fellas know I can't give you the hospital records. On the contrary, you're the only one who can. Joe's the attorney who represents a hospital. I got can't it. break the rules they pay me to uphold. Try to see my point of view. And you try to see ours. Our client was given no information. Unless we get a look at the hospital records, we don't even know if we've got a case, much less who it's against. Joe, if there's nothing wrong with the records, we'll drop the case. You locked the records away in a folder, or so you're trying to hide something. Is that what you think I'm doing? I don't know. I haven't even seen those records myself. Good, if you wanted to, you've got access to them. Well, that's right. And I also have access to Dr. Morgan. Look, I know Morgan did the very best possible job without looking it up in the record. You know what you're forcing me to do, Joe? Hopefully to go back and tell your client there's no case here. I wish in all conscience I could. I really believe she'd like that. No, I'll have to get a court order. Go through the whole rigmarole, waste a lot of time and money, and perhaps for nothing. And worse, experience has taught me that once you go to court, even for an order such as this, the client immediately believes there is a case. And I don't want to do that to Mrs. Dowson. I don't want to put her through any of this, unless and until I myself am thoroughly convinced that she has a legitimate grievance. I'll arrange to have a photocopy sent to you. Dr. Spencer? Yes. How do you do? Uh, my name is Kenneth Preston. I hope I'm not disturbing you, Doctor. No, not at all. Well, I'd like to uh, talk to you, if I may. Are you a patient here? No, I'm an attorney. Uh, may I sit down? Yes. Doctor, I want to speak to you about somebody who was a patient here. His name is Arthur Dowson. What about him? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. This is my wife. What about Mr. Dowson? Marge, I think it would be well, good. Our record shows that your husband assisted Dr. Morgan on the case. Now, I want to see if you could give some information about that. Such as? We want to establish the exact circumstances of his death. Don't you think you should be questioning Dr. Morgan? We already have. Well, didn't he tell you about him? No. Not very much. Now, I've seen a copy of the hospital records. There are some things that are unclear. Things that you might be able to help us with. Mr. Preston, do you think this is fair? What do you mean, fair? You must realize the position you're putting Dr. Spencer in. Whatever Dr. Morgan wanted you to know, I'm sure he would have told you. Is that your answer, Dr. Spencer? Well, since I don't know what the question is, it's hard to say. That's his answer. Is it, Doctor? Yes. Well, thank you. Why don't they keep people like that out of hospitals? Ambulance chasers trying to squeeze a dollar out of someone's misery. You know, that isn't true. He's got a legitimate case. Don't talk like that, Frank. You know what could happen. It's not just Dr. Morgan or the hospital. Nobody would say anything or do anything, but somehow those appointments you've earned would just pass right by you. You know that as well as I do. Now, you... You can't possibly think about talking to that lawyer. You can't. All right, you're right. Does that make you feel any better? No. Well, at least we've got that in common. Breathe. Breathe. You're about two months early for your regular checkup. Is there anything in particular bothering you? No, just practicing preventive medicine. It was your idea. 
Oh, by the way, Connie, uh, I have a hospital report here that might interest you. Well, that's fascinating. Isn't that what you really came for? What gives you such a suspicious nature? Long experience with you. You underestimate your healing powers, Connie. When you lay your hands on me, all symptoms disappear. Remind me to double my bill. Now, what's this all about? Take a look at that. You, Morgan. He's a very good man. What's the problem? The patient died on the table. While Morgan was operating, he bled to death. Why? How can you bleed to death in a modern hospital? Well, it's quite obvious this man had hemophilia. He was a bleeder. Shouldn't they have tested for that? Not normally. It, it's such a rare condition, it's not part of the routine blood test. Well, what about the nurse's report? Look at the record there. It says she took some blood for his arm for testing, and she had to come back three times and change the dressing because the bleeding didn't stop as it normally should. Now, that's unusual, isn't it? Well, let's say it looked suspicious. Suspicious enough for a surgeon to take extraordinary precautions? I would think so. But Dr. Morgan didn't take those precautions. He went right ahead and operated, didn't he? It's hard to believe, but it would seem that way. What I can't understand is why the patient didn't tell him. Wouldn't a man know if he had hemophilia? He might not. There are more than 20 different varieties, some of them comparatively mild. Now, unless he'd had an accident or some sort of surgery before, he might just think he bled more than most people. Then he might not have known. And if they didn't check, they might not have known. But still, they could do something. Medication, transfusions. You have to be prepared. Whole blood deteriorates too quickly, particularly the part that bleeders require. Now, quick frozen plasma has it, but it has to be thawed out. And while you're doing that, the patient could bleed to death. The way Arthur Dowson did. That's not what I said, Larry. Isn't it? Assuming the records are complete, and I'm certain that they aren't, you can't attack a man like Hugh Morgan without a great deal more information. Suppose the records are complete. Then what would you say? That someone was a fool. One more question. If I can prove to your satisfaction that it happened that way, prove it, will you come into court and testify for us? You know better than that, Larry. Not in a million years. <laughs> and what exactly do you want me to do? I'm sorry, I thought I made it clear in the note I sent with the hospital record, Professor Treen. I'd like you to take the stand and state in court just what you told us now. That Morgan's conduct did not conform to accepted standards of practice. Why should I? Well, Professor, because... Dr. Morgan made a mistake. A man died because everyone all but admits it, but no one's willing to stand up and say so. I think most of all because it's the decent and just thing to do. Your son suffers from a condition chronic to you. To you, everything is simple. Black or white. You throw words like justice and decency around us till they had some precise meaning. You will learn, I hope. But meanwhile, let your father do the talking. Uh, Mr. Preston, you, Morgan, was a student of mine, and I'm sure you are aware of his accomplishments. He has made many contributions to surgical technique, and his skill has saved the lives of I don't know how many people. Yes, I'm aware of that, Professor. You are also in a profession where the welfare and sometimes even the life of another is entrusted to your hands. Haven't you ever made a mistake? I have many times. So, would you want to have what you intend to do to Dr. Morgan done to you? The comparison doesn't hold, Professor. My clients are conscious. They have a chance to see and understand what's going on, to question me, differ with me, and even discharge me if they choose. But there is a much greater difference. When I make a mistake, it's an open court where it can't be hidden. Ah. Well, another question. Are you aware of the fact that there's a far better way of settling this? To the county medical society? Yes, I'm aware of that. It is intended to cover just this kind of situation. You bring your claim before the grievance committee. The facts will be weighed by a board of doctors. Uh, a far more logical and expert body than any jury you will ever get in a courtroom. And if your assumptions are correct, 
They will instruct Dr. Morgan to compensate your client. Professor Train, Hugh Morgan is no different from other people before the law. Neither he nor any doctor is entitled to special privileges or preferential treatment. Why should one man be judged by a jury and another by a selected group of his professional associates? Mrs. Dowson has a right to have a claim heard before a court and jury. I cannot agree to compromise that right. But uh, you haven't answered my question. About testifying? Well, I, I thought I had. The answer is no. I had hopes of changing your mind. Dr. Spencer? Yes. I'm Lawrence Preston. I represent Mrs. Dowson. I wanted to ask you to change your mind and talk to us. I know that. My son told me that his questions seem to upset your wife quite a bit. Well, she's a little overprotective at times. Let me get right to the point. We now have a copy of the hospital record. And on the surface, it makes Dr. Morgan look bad. But I have an idea it may not be what it seems. What does that mean? There's one blood test that wasn't taken. I think you'd better look at that record again. Arthur Dowson was given all normal pre-operative tests. Not for hemophilia. That is not a normal test. Now, if we test every patient for every known condition, we wouldn't be able to operate at all. And if someone died, they'd blame us for waiting so long. The nurse who took the blood from Arthur Dowson's arm noticed something unusual about his condition. She had to change the dressing three, three that different... That could be a normal condition, Mr. Preston. It doesn't necessarily mean hemophilia. Not necessarily. But it also doesn't indicate complete normality. Now, in view of the circumstances, why wasn't he tested further? What use will you make of anything that I tell you? I'll use it in any way I can. I'd certainly like you to come into court and testify for us. Mr. Preston, I want to be a good doctor. I think I will be. That involves certain things, but basically it has to do with a dedication that will consume most of my life. It also has to do with an old and proud tradition. Part of that tradition is that doctors usually don't testify against each other. As you call it a tradition, but others have called it a conspiracy of silence. There's a very good reason for it. Mr. Preston, do you know how many times an ill patient will come into a doctor's office and leave well? And the only thing that happens is that the doctor will let the person talk, will touch him, will give him some kind of simple medication. Yet it's because they have faith in him and in the medical profession that they're well again. There's no greater healer than faith. And what you're asking me to do is to try to destroy that faith. You think by testifying against Dr. Morgan, you'll undermine medicine. I maintain the exact opposite by refusing to testify. By cloaking medical practice or malpractice in secrecy, you undermine the very thing you hope to preserve. No, you don't. Not really. You don't know anything about Dr. Morgan and why I'm proud to work with him. Do you have any idea how many operations he performs every year with no fee at all? Do you have any idea how he devotes himself to his art? That's what surgery is. Not a science. An art, and he's a great artist. He saves more lives in one year than you've ever been involved with in your entire career. There's one life you didn't save. Dr. Spencer, sooner or later, most of us have to choose between our convictions and what is politely referred to as being practical. It's always a tough decision, but it's the most important decision you'll ever make. I've already made it. Good night, Mr. Preston. Come in. May I speak to you for a moment? Yeah, sure. Sit down. You look kind of tired, Frank. You're the one who told me I'd look tired for the rest of my life. Well, that's true. What's on your mind? Dr. Morgan. We've been working together for over one year now. It's the most important thing that's ever happened to me. I know that. I keep telling myself how lucky I am. Well, I'm very glad about that, Frank. But I don't think you came in here just to tell me that, did you? 
It's about the Dowson case. What about it? They're after me to testify. They seem to know all about it. I honestly don't know what to do. Why not? I never saw you make a mistake before in your life, except that one time. What do you expect me to do about it? Try to justify myself? I don't know. Don't you feel guilty? Guilty? No, Frank. No. I've lost patience on the operating table before. It's always a devastating experience, naturally. I've told myself that maybe if I'd uh, been a little quicker, a little more deft, a little less tired, the dead man might still be alive. But then I've made myself remember the almost dead men that, uh, that I've saved. Somebody else might have let die. I regret profoundly that Arthur Dawson died. You know that. But I can't let it destroy my effectiveness as a surgeon. And that's all you feel? No. No, I wish that's all I felt. I'm supposed to be the un unemotional operating machine. And yet when it happened, I wanted to walk away and never come back. But I knew I had the responsibility of other patients, other lives. I knew I couldn't keep on thinking about Arthur Dawson. But he died because you made a mistake. Oh, really? In whose eyes? Twelve jurors? Twelve laymen whose only concept of medicine is, a, is something you take with a spoon when you're going to bellyache? Are they going to tell me that I made a mistake? Are they going to judge me? In other words, you think doctors are above the law. No, Frank, I don't think that. If I shoot somebody, if I break the speed limit, if I steal, let them prosecute and punish me. But not because a patient dies while I'm operating. There are too many things they don't, they don't know about. A thousand factors they can't comprehend. They'd have to spend years in medical school. I spent those years, doctor, and I know you're not blameless. Well, Frank, I'm not perfect either. I try to do my job the very best I can. And that's usually just about perfect, except in this particular case, doctor. Well, forget about this particular case. A surgeon can't dwell on one particular case, on one particular mishap, on one death. There are too many other patients. There are too many other lives that need his undivided attention. Now, how many lives should I be expected to sacrifice to explain for one death? I don't think that's the alternative. Oh, well, then they didn't teach you that in school. Oh, I don't care about this one lawsuit, Frank. I can stand it financially. And losing it is not going to hurt my reputation. Then why are you... Fighting so hard against losing it. Why am I fighting? For That's me? my question. I'm fighting for my profession. Every time a doctor loses one of these lawsuits, everybody suffers. The patient as well as the doctors. The result is a lot of doctors are scared. They're afraid to try things. It's even in the most desperate circumstances. Because the consequence of failure may well be the witness stand. A fellow I went to school with once admitted to me. Then he refused to come forward and announced that he was a doctor and he'd just seen an accident. And I can hardly blame him. If that victim had died, the doctor would have been hit with a lawsuit. His reputation would have been damaged. His career ruined, his career, his life. And they accuse us of conspiratorial secrecy. Secrecy? They're forcing us into it. It's so hard for me to let him go. Little by little, the past becomes blurred, like a sharp photo slowly going out of focus. After a while, it isn't clear enough to hurt us anymore. It always happens. It takes time. There's no point in trying to forget. There's no point in avoiding being reminded. His suits are still hanging in his closet. I uh, still check his shirts to make sure they're clean. I, I sometimes hear him calling to me from outside, you know, from, from the car. I uh, sometimes answer him, but then I say to myself, no, he's dead. No matter how we handle it, the past slowly goes away. Doesn't only the uh, present remains. And the future. That's what you must think about. 
Future? What future? Yours and your child's. Where do we go from here? We go through the motions of living, eating, and sleeping. And then when she gets old enough to understand, I'll say to her, darling, you're an orphan. And I'm a widow because somebody made a mistake. But she's five. She doesn't understand why he's not here to kiss her goodnight. I'm, I'm older than five, and I, and I don't understand it either. That's why you're bringing suit, Mrs. Dawson. I want to win this case. I, I don't care about the money. I, I want to know why. I, I want to know who did this to me and why. The law can't give you back your husband. All it can do is establish the facts. And if the facts prove that your husband's death was caused by negligence, then whoever is to blame must pay. Money for my husband's life. How do you set a price on that? We'll base our claim on life expectancy, earning capacity, loss of services as husband and father. You want me to auction off my husband? How much for nine years of loving somebody? I never wanted anything in my whole life but to be married to my husband. And you want me to get up on a witness stand and say, ladies and gentlemen, I want money for my husband. Pay me X dollars. If we discover Dr. Morgan was negligent, that's what I expect you to say. And also this, all that was rightfully mine, my husband, my happiness, the father of my daughter, my support, was taken from me by a man who did less than his best. The law says you're entitled to recompense for the loss of your husband. And I say you're obligated to accept it for yourself and especially your child. But she can be the richest orphan on the block. I am not here to convince you that Dr. Morgan is a bad doctor, incompetent, unfeeling. I couldn't do that. He happens to be a fine doctor, an exceptional surgeon, but fallible. Subject to human error and oversight, we all are. And we're all subject to the same laws. And if by being derelict in our duty, another human being suffers, we are responsible before the law and before God. We're not here to prove or disprove the competence of Dr. Morgan. We will prove, however, that in this one case, in the case of Arthur Dowson, Dr. Morgan was remiss. The law expects from every member of the medical profession knowledge, skill, and performance consistent with the status accorded him. We will prove that in the case of Arthur Dowson, Dr. Hugh Morgan did not live up to that responsibility, did not fulfill that expectation. Yes, my husband was always in excellent health. In fact, we used to joke about it. We always used to... Mrs. Dawson, please go on. Well, we always used to say that it's a good thing the doctors weren't depending on him. They'd starve to death. What is the nature of your business, Mr. Pike? We manufacture machinery to make corrugated paper and cardboard. And Arthur Dawson was employed by you? Yes, as plant supervisor. He was in charge of the factory. He was steady, smart. All the men looked up to him. Would you give an opinion as to his future with your company? A very promising future. I was preparing him to run the entire business for me. I was planning to retire in a year or two. What was Arthur Dawson's salary? With bonuses, 15000 a year. Had any decision been made as to what he would be paid upon your retirement? Well, I haven't decided on that definitely, but it would have been between 20, 25. That kind of man is hard to get. In other words, he was in excellent health? As far as I could tell. You did examine him. Yes. Then please just answer the question, yes or no. Aside from the hernia, was Arthur Dowson in excellent condition? Yes. One last question. Now, was the condition of the hernia you discovered acute? In other words, did you consider it an emergency situation? It didn't seem that way, please, but I... Please, doctor, yes or no? No. You may cross-examine. Dr. Fallon... You said that your examination of Arthur Dowson was not exhaustive. Could you explain what you meant? 
He had no complaints, no record of illness, no pain. I ran only the usual tests. Did you take a blood sample? Yes, of course. Did it indicate anything of an unusual nature? No. In your discussion with him, did Mr. Dowson tell you anything that would have led you to suspect that he had a tendency toward excessive bleeding? No, he did not. Thank you, Doctor. That's all. Now, Miss Baldwin, you are the nurse who took the blood samples from Arthur Dowson's arm prior to the operation, are you not? I am. Did you notice anything unusual at the time? I did not. Not? That's what I said, sir. I did not. You noted on your report, Miss Baldwin, that the patient seemed to be bleeding inordinately from the needle puncture. Didn't you so note? I did. And now you claim that such bleeding is not unusual? That's right. It happens quite often in the most normal patients. It's often caused by puncturing too deeply or other superficial causes. It doesn't signify hemophilia. But it could. Well, I suppose it might. But it isn't often likely. Still, you thought it important enough to note on your report. My job is to note everything. And to say nothing. I'm afraid I don't understand you, sir. I'm afraid you do, Miss Baldwin. Hello, Frank. My very late. My patient's in there. All prepared and ready to go as soon as you're scrubbed, Doctor. Should have been caught today, Frank. Should have heard what those lawyers had to say about me. You hear them, you think I was a chronic murderer. Must have been rough. Ah, uh, you work all your life long for an ideal, and then one day something like this happens. You stop and wonder what it's all about. Who am I saving? Humanity? What for? What would they do to you? I wonder why I'm rushing back here from the court, why I'm risking my neck to save that patient in there. If I lose him, I'll probably be hailed back in the court. I don't need this, Frank. This needs you. Well, that sounds funny coming from you. The other day, you were lecturing me on law and morality. And you should have known better. I guess this day was rougher than I thought. Well, every day is rougher than you think. Wait till you get up here where I am. See how they try to tear you down? You try to save them, they come around and try to kill you. They're within their legal rights. Legal rights, Frank. Dead people have no legal rights. That's what they are when they bring them in here. Most of them half dead. It's up to you to save them, to give them back their lives. And we do that most of the time. But nobody bets a thousand. Not ball players, not doctors, not lawyers. They don't hold Preston into court when he loses a case. If he's derelict in his duty, they do. And whose team are you on? I hope I'm not on anybody's team. Then why are you wearing that uniform? Doctor, you have testified that Arthur Dowson bled to death while you were operating. That you could not stem the bleeding because he suffered from a form of hemophilia. Yes. You also stated that you were not aware of this condition until the operation was in progress. Yes. Have you ever operated on a bleeder before, Doctor? A few times. And has the same thing happened? Have they bled to death? No. Doctor, I show you this folder. Plaintiff's exhibit number three. And ask if you can identify it. It's the hospital report on the Dowson case. You've seen it before? Naturally. When? Many times. Before or after the operation? Both. And you read it carefully? Yes, carefully. Including the nurse's report? Including everything. Well, then you must have known the patient had a tendency to excessive bleeding. I didn't know anything of the kind. Would you mind reading the nurse's entry on this record with regard to the patient's reactions to taking blood from his arm? Bleeding from sight of blood withdrawal took 50 minutes to stop change dressings three times. And that in no way indicated to you that the patient had a tendency to inordinate bleeding? It indicated nothing of the kind, as you heard the nurse testify here. We've heard Miss Baldwin's testimony, Doctor. We're interested in yours now. Having seen the nurse's remarks on the sheet before the operation, did you order any further blood tests on the patient? I did not. In my opinion, they weren't necessary. In your opinion, did that conform to accepted standards of medical treatment? Objection, Your Honor. 
Counsel is not allowed to elicit an opinion from the defendant. Sustained. Referring to the hospital record, Dr. Morgan, will you tell us what time Arthur Dowson was originally scheduled for surgery? Four o'clock in the afternoon. 4 p.m. And instead, what time was he operated on? 11 in the morning. In other words, uh, five hours earlier than it was scheduled. Is that correct? Yes. Did you hear Dr. Fallon testify that there was no emergency involved? Well, that was his opinion at that time. Then do you differ with him? Perhaps we differ on the meaning of the word emergency. But I thought it necessary to operate then. Could you tell the court and jury the reason for that? Your Honor, Dr. Morgan has already answered that question. Well, then the doctor shouldn't mind answering it again. I don't mind. Thank you, doctor. Go ahead. Emergency is a key word in my profession. It's used to describe the constant climate of a hospital. We don't have enough beds. That's an emergency. We don't have enough doctors. That's an emergency. Not enough nurses, not enough hospitals, not enough money, not enough sleep. All emergencies. In fact, the only things we have in any full supply are patients. We have a frightening abundance of those. Now, Arthur Dowson came in as a, a routine operation. But every operation, no matter how routine, no how, how minor, is performed in an operating room. And it occupies the time and the attention of many doctors and many nurses. It occupies the operating room itself. So when what you'd call a real emergency comes up, now let's say from an automobile accident or maybe a shooting or a ruptured appendix, it becomes a question of time and space. If we can't get into an operating room, we might lose a patient. So we work as circumstances permit. Now I operated on Arthur Dowson at 11 o'clock in the morning because I had no way of knowing that at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, the operating room would not be needed. Or that I myself might not be needed for a more urgent case. Doctor, what time did you arrive at the hospital that morning? I was there all night. All night? Oh, were you sleeping? Well, part of the time. How much of the time? Two hours, I think. What were you doing the rest of the time? I was in surgery. Operating? Yes. Doctor, how many operations did you perform in the 24-hour period preceding the operation on Arthur Dowson? Six. Six? Isn't that a lot for a 24-hour period? I suppose you could call it a lot. Do you call it a lot? Yes. Weren't you tired? I don't let myself think in those terms, Mr. Preston. Like any other doctor, I do what's demanded of me as long as I can. And in that period, a great deal was demanded of you. So much, in fact, that out of sheer fatigue, you neglected the precautions that might have saved Arthur Dowson's life. Isn't that so? Your Honor, objection. That's a conclusion, not a question. There's been no proof to support such a conclusion. No proof? Dr. Morgan has admitted that he didn't have any knowledge that Dowson was a bleeder, and that even after reading the nurse's report, he omitted certain steps that would have revealed that fact. All I'm trying to... Dr. Preston, the counsel for the defense has a point. I must ask you to refrain from stating opinions as facts. The objection is sustained. You may state your own opinions in your summation, Mr. Preston. Now, do you have any further questions you wish to ask of this witness? Yes, Your Honor, I have. Now, Dr. Morgan, it has been stated here that Arthur Dowson, the decedent, was a victim of one of the numerous forms of hemophilia, that he was a bleeder. Yes. And it's also been stated that you didn't have any knowledge of this condition. That's correct. And that even after you read the nurse's report, wherein she stated that the patient had an excessive flow of blood from the blood test taken from his arm? That's correct. Now, doctor, isn't it true that in your zeal to keep the operating room free in case a true emergency came along, you neglected to read the nurse's report, and as a result of that neglect, Arthur Dowson died? Objection, that's argumentative. I'll withdraw the question. That's all, Doctor. No questions. Do you have any more witnesses, Mr. Preston? Mr. Preston? Yes, Your Honor. I call Dr. Frank Spencer.
You swear that the testimony you're about to give in the case on trial is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Your Honor, may we approach the bench? Uh, come up, gentlemen. in the middle of a trial? They can settle it up any moment before the jury brings in its verdict. And I think you're about to win your case. Court will take a brief recess. I'll see counsel in chambers. Excuse me. I don't think you'll have to testify any further. I haven't said anything yet. Dr. Morgan and his attorney don't seem to think so. See, all you really had to do was show up. I'd like to thank you for that. Well, I have to stay here very long. I should get back to the hospital. Mm, only a few minutes, I think. I'll be back. Thanks again. explain this even to myself. I just think you're too great a doctor to have to avoid the truth. So why you showed up today? Just to keep me honest? I never thought you wouldn't be, doctor. Now I showed up because I believe that only by admitting our mistakes can we ever convince people that we are, after all, only human. Yes, people uh, do seem to forget that. What's worse, we doctors forget it ourselves. I think we have to be reminded once in a while that we're not medical machines. What finally decided you to come to court? I looked through the hospital records and found out what operation you did perform at 4 o'clock that afternoon. And what was it, I forget? A tonsillectomy. Arthur Dawson didn't have to die to make room for that. Well, the case is almost over. You can work out your explanations and I'll work out mine. Suppose we just let it go at that. Dr. Spencer, I have major surgery at 7.30 in the morning. I'd like you to be there on time. You better go home and get some sleep. <laughs> yes, sir. I'll see you at 7. I think we'll be able to arrive at a fair settlement. I suppose I should be happy. Well, I think you will be, Mrs. Dawson. The money's not going to make life happier, but it will make it easier for you. I'll never get used to having the money. But thank you. gentlemen are off to a victory celebration. Do you always celebrate after a successful operation? No, that's my job. Then we're not really very different, are we? Anyway, a victory for one side assumes a defeat for the other. I'm not so sure you've been defeated, Doctor. To pay for a mistake is good for the soul. Wouldn't you say that? I might. Yeah. 